a prayer, please. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jack Robinson. My traditional name is the Heat Wave Man. Name that was given to me by my grandmother when I was born 84 years ago. So I always use my traditional name when I'm doing a prayer. I was signing a seminar in the Mama, <laughs> It was easy to send him walk, send him to him, don't come in and come in and go, okay? Walk on my gun. Our creator, grandfathers, was sitting on four directions. We give you thanks to the creator for giving us another day. We give thanks to the creator for all your wonderful gifts on Mother Earth of fire, water, and air that we breathe. We give you thanks to the creator. For those of us that are able to, to gather for this meeting, those of us that are well enough, we pray for those that are less fortunate. We pray for the ones that are still suffering. We ask, O oh, Creator, that you protect our children. As we are in mourning, a lot of things is happening on Mother Earth. The discovery of what is of children in the residence schools. And the hatred, tragedy that had happened to another nation of a family that were run over by the truck. We also pray, O oh Creator, today for our young people that are suffering that are suffering from alcohol and drugs, that are suffering because their parents or addicted. We pray for our little ones that can get the proper guidance from someone who cares for them. We pray, oh my creator, for all because that are in the hospitals. We pray for the family, the RCMP officer. We pray, O oh Creator, as you bring peace again to our land, that we ask of my Creator, grandfathers, grandmothers, and all our relations. Hey, hey, thank you. Thank you, Jack. Um, it's an honor to see you again, and thank you for opening up our are meeting in the right way. Uh, we can almost smell the sage, uh, or hopefully we can. Uh, we can see it a little bit, so that makes me feel good. Um, before we get started, um, I'd like to acknowledge uh, that uh, we are on the ancestral lands of Treaty 1 territory, and we have speakers today also coming from Treaty 5 territory. These are the traditional lands of the Anishinaabeg, the Inenu, the Anishinaabeg, the Nakoda and Dene peoples, and it's also homeland of the Métis Nation. I think it's crucial that we acknowledge the ongoing discrimination experienced by Indigenous peoples at the hands of the Canadian government on Treaty 1 and all other territories in Canada. 
After this month's discovery of 215 students buried underneath uh, an old residential school in Kamloops, we should be aware that our workplace, the Health Sciences Centre is located six kilometres away from the Assiniboia Indian Residential School that was in operation from 1957 to 1973. I acknowledge that as a white male, I have the responsibility to play in reconciliation to honour this truth um, and would like to state on behalf of my team within DREAM that we also acknowledge the truth and reconciliation call to action number 18 that states that the current state of Aboriginal health in Canada, including the state of type 2 diabetes in children, is the direct result of previous and ongoing Canadian government policies, including residential schools, and to recognize and implement the health care rights of Indigenous people as identified by international law, constitutional law, and under the treaties. Um, this uh, land acknowledgement was not my own, but it was uh, co-written by a summer student in our lab, Isaac Fast, and uh, Tracy Laost, who uh, is a friend of his, uh, who's currently at the uh, uh, as a Métis woman studying at the University of Regina. Um, I would like to acknowledge our, our, our speakers today, and I ask you that you turn your cameras on if you can. So we have uh, Elder Jack Robinson, thank you for that prayer. Um, hello, Jack. Uh, he's the Elder in Residence and uh, Knowledge Keeper at the Mama Wetak Friendship Centre in Thompson. He's also the uh, Manitoba-based Elder for the Indigenous Youth Mentorship Program. Anything else we should add, Jack? I think that's what it is. Too much to go on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we also have Jessica Beardy, who's here with us from Garden Hill First Nation. Kissed again watching. Hello, Jessica. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for, work. <laughs> thanks for coming on. Um, and Tamir Beardy. Hi, good day. <laughs> Jessica is a uh, young adult health leader uh, running the program up in her community. Ter uh, Tamara is the coordinator for IYMP for all of Manitoba. Um, and do you want to say a few things, Jessica or Tamara, before we get started? Um, I only just want to say Miles Martin is supposed to be on and hopefully he comes on. I've been texting him. So hopefully he'll be on as well. I'll resend the thing so he can try and log in again. Great, and Miles will be joining us um, from Sandy Bay First Nation. Uh, so before we get started, uh, this is being recorded just so that everyone is aware. Uh, we're hosting this webinar series, Insulin 100, in partnership with the Children's Hospital Foundation and the Children's Hospital Research Institute. Um, I am one of the uh, scientists at the Children's Hospital Research Institute in Manitoba, also known as CRIM. And I'm a co-lead with Fern Delinsky of the Dream Theme. And we're celebrating the 100th year uh, anniversary of this, the discovery of insulin, which has saved the lives of um, millions of children and adults worldwide living with diabetes. Um, and we're doing it with a webinar series to inform people of what we're doing here in Manitoba to improve the lives of people living with diabetes and their, and their families. Um, this is the third iteration. And uh, today we'll be speaking about a program that's funded through uh, the dream theme um, that's called the Indigenous Youth Mentorship Program that we do in collaboration with Indigenous communities across the country. So we'll start with a, a little overview of what the IYMP program is and then we'll turn it over to Jessica, Tamara, Jack and hopefully Miles as we get started. If you have any questions please put them in the chat and I'll be able to answer those. Um, so with that I will start to share my screen. And just remind everyone how grateful we are to the Children's Hospital Foundation and CRIM for um, allowing us to do the work that we do here and uh, supporting research dedicated to type 2 diabetes or diabetes in children. Um, okay, so this is about the Indigenous Youth mentorship program. Um, I don't have any conflicts to declare, although our lab is funded by CHR and this project is as well, as well as the Lawson Foundation, the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Canada. And this project is also funded by Diabetes Canada and Diabetes Action Canada, which are key partners in our work. Um, if you want to get a hold of me or uh, communicate with me, you can go through those. Um, when we talk about type 2 diabetes or any um, health condition that affects Indigenous youth disproportionately, we must recognize the TRC call to action number 18. Um, and I'll just remind you that 
Differences with regards to rates of type 2 diabetes between Indigenous and non-Indigenous children are the direct result of previous government policies, including but not limited to residential schools. And in that context, when I first came here to the university and I wanted to work with youth living with type with diabetes, um, it wasn't until we started to work closely with communities and listen to stories from elders and community members and community leaders about the importance of this intergenerational trauma and the legacy of Canadian policies in the development and the risk for type 2 diabetes. Importantly, elders said, diabetes did not exist in our communities until the white person came or the white man came. And if we look at diabetes through that lens, then the traditional um, approaches to diabetes prevention or diabetes management through the Western lens or the colonial lens just doesn't fit. If, di if diabetes is the direct, direct result of cultural genocide or direct genocide, then interventions that we develop need to address these root causes before they can uh, move on to other things. And so what is the transgenerational stress that, that our uh, elders and Indigenous colleagues have talked about for generations? Well, the first is residential schools, which you're hearing a lot about this month. But residential schools were designed to um, remove culture, language, um, and a sense of being Indigenous from Indigenous children for generations. Uh, it was part of a government-funded um, strategy to destroy um, key sources of meaning and, and, and healing and health for Indigenous people, which included the loss of language, um, the destruction of culture, and of course, the ongoing um, destruction and removal of Indigenous people from their lands. And if language, culture, and connection to land are core elements of the Indigenous way, um, then uh, these elements need to be restored in any program that's focused on health and well-being of Indigenous children. Why do we focus here in Manitoba on type 2 diabetes in youth? Here are the rates of type 2 diabetes that of children who are being seen in the children's hospital for type 2 diabetes. The first case was a young girl diagnosed from the Island Lake area back in the early 1980s, mid 1980s by Dr. Heather Dean, who delivered the first webinar of this series. And um, up until 2013 and continuing on to the, uh, the last few years, uh, the pediatric endocrinology team is seeing roughly um, one case per week of a child living with type 2 diabetes. Um, who is this affecting? While all children are affected by type 2 diabetes worldwide, children of color and particularly Indigenous children in Canada are dramatically disproportionately affected by type 2 diabetes. Um, and therefore, uh, our group has focused largely on working with Indigenous to communities to co-develop programs. If the trauma and the stress of um, cultural genocide is a root cause of type 2 diabetes, then our group has committed ourselves to focusing on strategies and including strategies in um, our programs that try to overcome these. Importantly, we're not trying to decolonize. And I honestly, as a white person working in this space, I don't think decolonizing is actually um, a term that we can achieve. Uh, it would be uh, parallel to saying we could de-genocide, which I don't think we can. But what we can do is try to work closely in parallel with Indigenous communities and listen to elders and leaders in the community to bring back the things that are, are um, core elements of health. And so in this regard, we turned to the work of an Indigenous scholar, Dr. Martin Brokenleg, and created a program that uh, was grounded in these four principles of resilience. Uh, the principle of belonging is the first and core element into the program where children are given a sense of connecting to each other, connecting to their school community, and connecting to their um, Indigenous culture in the community in which they live. The second is to focus on strengths-based approaches um, and a mastery of skills within their domain. Uh, a simple question that we might ask youth is, um, tell us something that you're good at that you would want to bring to this program. And by giving youth a sense of mastery, we move away from the Western um, deficit approach of looking at disease through an illness lens and rather the indigenous approach, strengths-based approach of looking at health and healing through uh, a positive strengths-based uh, um, view. Uh, third, a core element of developing as a child and developing as a teenager is 
um, developing that sense of independence and that sense of self. So working not only with the children to say what elements of our program are essential for you and you would like to bring to your program, but the independence and the self-determination of the communities to say, while we're interested in preventing type two diabetes, what are the things that you and your community need to bring that wanna see in your school-based programming that will ensure the health of children? And lastly, um, generosity as a core element of giving back. And the, the key aspect of generosity within our program is the fact that our program is not led by healthcare providers. And I recognize the important and critical work that health providers do um, bring to this space, but we rely on the strengths and the skills of adolescent teenagers uh, or adolescents or teenagers and young adults who are champions in their community and giving back to their community by co-developing and delivering this uh, program to children. So what is IYMP? IYMP is a program led by uh, young adult health leaders. We have two of them with us today uh, that we'll talk to you in a minute. They learn the, the core curriculum and the skills um, that we've developed that are core assets of, AY, of AYMP. They then recruit high school students in their community who are interested in being youth leaders. And those, uh, those teenagers develop a 20 week program that's usually delivered between January and May every year in the schools. Um, to young grade four students. Uh, so they provide mentoring, role modeling, they create a sense of belonging and leadership, and they deliver uh, activities in the form of um, teachings in their community. They deliver practical physical activity sessions and a healthy snack. Um, and each community gets to de deliver that program in a way that, that suits them. Importantly, this, if this program runs for four or five years, um, this program eventually becomes uh, a self-fulfilling program. So the grade four youth become uh, high school mentors and those high school mentors often move on to become young adult health leaders. Um, a core component that each group, each IOMP program is encouraged to bring on are the restoration of cultural practices and cultural ways of being. Um, or traditional activities or traditional Indigenous games. In this case, this was an activity led by Elders Barb and Clarence Nipanak, uh, which was a teepee raising activity. So land-based activities, cultural restoration or activities are things that are strongly encouraged and, and supported within IYMP and that we hope that each community brings to their programming. Another element is a sense of connection and a sense of belonging across communities in Canada. So young adult health leaders are, are ab absolutely essential for this program, but they're often on their own and they may not get the type of training um, that would uh, give them the skills and the confidence needed to be able to run these programs. And so once a year, we bring the groups together to face-to-face uh, -to -face gatherings. Here we're in Little Current, just outside the community of Wemakong, uh, where young adult health leaders get together. They share stories, they share uh, traditions, they share activities, um, and then, uh, those activities are brought back to their community. So in this picture, we have youth from Cross Lake, uh, Garden Hill First Nation, uh, Ganawake, uh, downtown Saskatoon, uh, and a couple of communities in Alberta, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so what have we found? Well, our first publication came out back in 2014. Um, they Rec and Read team uh, has been running this program of IYMP for years. And for the first time uh, back in about 2010, the Rec and Read team brought this program back up to the community of Garden Hill. We worked very closely with um, the ADI worker, uh, Larry Wood, Aboriginal Diabetes Initiative worker. And this became the master's thesis for Pinar Escajolo. Um, Jessica Beardy, who's with us here today, uh, was working with someone named Nick Kojima and this program came back to Garden Hill and we evaluated it for its effectiveness on preventing type two diabetes. What we found was that youth who were in IYMP or AYMP as it was called back then, were less likely to gain weight around their waist. They saw reductions in their body weight and they saw improvements in self-efficacy while they were in the program in grade four to a greater extent than when they were not in the program either in grade three or grade five. Most importantly, the changes that they saw in their uh, type 2 diabetes risk factors were related to their improvements in their self-efficacy or their positive sense of, of how they feel about themselves. 
Since then, we've done a number of other uh, studies, one of which was a qualitative study of youth living in different communities. And what we found was, in contrast to the Western approach to preventing type 2 diabetes that focuses only on exercise and diet as a way to reduce your body weight or improve your insulin sensitivity, Indigenous youth felt that supporting the concept of Mino Pimatazuin, which is a Cree term, or uh, Mino Bimatazuin, which is the Anishinaabe term, supporting youth by making them live well or feel good, um, support growth of themselves as adolescents or as children of young, uh, strong Indigenous youth, and supporting happiness in their community were three core elements to promoting Mino Bimatazuin in their school, and by promoting living in a good way, we would experience a reduced risk for type 2 diabetes. And while this is something that um, is jointly led by scientists, it's youth that really drive this program forward. So the youth in the program are involved in traveling to communities to demonstrate the effectiveness and bring new communities onto our team. Um, young people in the communities also partner with med students when they're doing their different projects or their, or their PhD theses and co-present the work that they do and the data they've collected um, to not only support the principles of OCAP, but to recognize the important part of self-determination in terms of uh, research and community. The third element that I'd like to describe that's unique, I think, to our group is the uh, annual gatherings that prior to COVID-19, we did um, starting in 2016. This was our first gathering, bringing together elders, teachers, youth, children, their families, knowledge keepers uh, to share their experiences and co-develop the path forward for our team. So this is us at the Human Rights Museum here in Winnipeg, launching our team for the first time. Here's us in year two, going out to Kananaskis to partner with our key um, leaders in ever active schools, uh, Brian Torrance here in Alberta, and bringing youth together to, again, meet one another, but also experience different, uh, different lands in Canada. Um, we not only uh, do the scientific work, we also get to know each other and have a lot of fun and bring together groups of people that wouldn't otherwise get to meet to do some fun things out and about. And don't ask me why I'm dressed as a banana or this young fella is, but uh, it's a good story that we can get in later. Mm -hmm. And just prior to COVID, this was our last gathering uh, where we had up to 100 people from the nearly 30 communities that are involved in IYMP. And we also partnered with some core groups uh, and really important leaders from across Canada in this space. Um, I'd like to really acknowledge uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Alex McComber, uh, who is part of this team and also runs a parallel project in his community called the Ganawake School Diabetes Prevention Program. So our, our program started in one community and then slowly progressed out to five communities um, and then now seven in Manitoba, partnering with Garden Hill First Nation, uh, Sandy Bay, uh, First Nation, um, the city of Thompson, Waboden, Split Lake, um, uh, Sagin First Nation, um, and also the multiple rec and read programs in the city. Since then, we expanded out to 12 communities across the country, and currently we're in nearly 30 communities across Canada, and we're currently working with an organization called LEAP to take this, and it will then become a non-for-profit a standalone organization uh, led by Indigenous leaders um, and embedded in the non-for-profit sector. We're also deeply committed as a, as a group in DREAM and as a group to IYMP to anti-racism and cultural safety training. This is a workshop that we did, Elder Jack was here, uh, where we brought together trainees and scientists from across the country to learn from uh, elders and learn from Indigenous uh, leaders, knowledge keepers, scholars about what it, the future of shared health looks like and um, self-determined health uh, through an Indigenous lens. And so with that, I would like to turn it over to our group and thank everyone uh, who's tuned in and maybe give you a little more of a glimpse of what IYMP looks like through the lens of young adult health leaders. And so maybe I'll turn it over to Jessica first and then to Miles and just say, could you explain to us, Jessica, first and then Miles, uh, what is IYMP like in your community and how are you delivering it? Um, well, we work with um, the high school kids who we, normally I would sign up like a sign up list for. Like they know that what the mentorship is because it's been there for years. So they're always looking forward to it, I think. 
and then we would have like about 50 people sign up or more the high school high school kids and then i would work with them and explain what they need to do with uh, elementary school kids and then i let them plan what they want to do i guess um uh me and my co-workers kelsey and austin we would um get the food but we won't prepare it we get the high school kids the mentors to do all of the planning all this setting up and like what games they want to play but last year we had uh, yeah last year we had about too many people so we had to do two groups so we had one group in the kitchen for snacks with half the mentors and then the other half in the gym playing and then about halfway through we switch so the other half is eating and then the other half is playing that was pretty cool I think they really enjoyed it. That's awesome. Having too many youth participating is a great thing. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't want to send anyone away. So we had to think of a way to get them all involved. That's great. And we really want to thank you, Jessica, because you bringing this program back up to your community with uh, Nick really got the ball rolling here. And so uh, you and your work and your commitment to this program has, has really seen this family grow grow large so thank you very much it was um pretty fun i guess when i was in high school i was a mentor at the uh, cody and then i just remember how it felt working with the kids and i wanted the youth here to feel the same way thank thank you so much miles can you tell us a, a few things about your program and maybe some of the things you're really proud of Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Hi, I'm Miles. I joined the um, AYMP program a few years ago. Um, the program out here consists of about 40 grade four students and about 20 high school mentors. Um, the program out here is something that the kids always look forward to each each week we have the program because they'll always, I, I work at the school as well as an IT technician for the school. And I would see the kids walking in the hallway. Hi, is it mentorship today? Yes, it is. You know, they are all excited every week just to come and then spend a good couple hours after school. We, we have an hour of physical activity in the gymnasium. And then we have about half an hour of having snacks and then another half hour of free time where you can go do this and that. And um, the program was really beneficial for us because it not only gave us sense of belonging to the kids that really, like they really needed it. You know, they've, they wanted to be in the program, not just because we're trying to make them, it's because eventually they wanted to. They wanted to open up and branch out and introduce themselves to new ways to, you know, of, of things to do, things you, you, you want to participate in and it, it helps them open up and they like doing it. They loved being there in the program and every week was so fun for us. And it not only benefited them, it benefited me as well as, being one of the young adult health leaders at the first few years, I was quite nervous and eventually I got used to it and it helped me uh, develop skills that I actually really, uh, I really benefited from too, because I do a bunch of other stuff on the side as well, you know, game thons and working on uh, around the community and everything. And um, what it meant to them was every week they got to go somewhere they got to be somewhere with their friends. They got to hang out. They got to do physical activity besides their actual school, like their gym class. This time they can do, they can have fun with their own activities. And um, they got to choose the games, you know, afterwards the games happen, the activities, we go outside, we clean up, they'd be in the gym, we'd be doing games. Afterwards we would, uh, we would have like, a snack in the multi-purpose room where we have healthy fruits, vegetables, juices, like granola bars, good snacks and everything. And um, every week they always liked coming to it because, you know, they belonged. They belonged there. They wanted to be there. The high school students and the grade four students. That was 
something they always look forward to. And sad to say we haven't been having program, but you know, that's always something good. If it, if it was running, it would be so, it would be magic. You know, it would be so cool for them to, to see them every week. They would have big smiles. They would know who's there all the time and which friends they get to see every week. And it was so awesome. Um, AYMP is a really good program and I'm, I swear everybody misses it out here. All the students that we've had, the high school students when I started were grade four students. Now they're in high school, like, wow. And they're so respectful. They're nice. They learned a lot of things. They learned how to, you know, express themselves without having any repercussions. They can be themselves without nobody teasing them, nobody questioning why they're like that. You know, it's just because they belong. That is very important. Awesome. Thanks, Miles. Um, so it has been challenging, and maybe I'll ask Tamara. Uh, Tamara's from Tatasquia Cree Nation and our, is our coordinator. You had a chance to try to do some IYMP COVID style. Uh, so do you want to maybe tell us what IYMP has been like for you as a mom and as a, as a coordinator, but also what have we done during the COVID time uh, to try to support uh, healthy, active youth in Manitoba? Um, first of all, I'm Tamara Beardy. Those of you that don't know me, um, I'm from Northern Manitoba, like John said, from Tataskuyak, and I came and joined John's team in 2016. So uh, kind of when, you know, overviewing all of what he just shared earlier, like just made me reflect on, uh, you know, what time has gone by and what we've all, you know, been doing and created and seeing it all roll out. Uh, it just amazes me because um, you know, Miles shared earlier and Jessica and they were sh very shy at one point and, and scared to, to take this on on their own. Um, but now, you know, after a few years, this is theirs. They've created their own program and that's amazing and awesome to see. Um, I have a daughter who lives with type 1 diabetes, so a lot of, you know, uh, these community building and relationships and, you know, being able to um, reach those children because my daughter was nine when she was diagnosed. So um, just being able to do that work, give some basic understanding of what diabetes is in, in those schools because I was a parent, you know, had a nine-year-old nine daughter and I didn't really know the background of diabetes until it hit my family and my daughter. So, um, you know, I've learned along this journey with IYMP a lot of, a lot of things and those points that um, we hear our, our program from, like those uh, quadrants that we deliver and how we try to deliver it um, really helps our children have their own voice, have a place of say and, you know, um, and, um, I guess uh, during COVID, uh, I do a lot of check-ins with communities every week. I always make sure I'm supporting a lot of my y'alls because like they both said, the program is such a, it's become vital for uh, interaction with their kids. And I see it when I do community visits as well. Like you can, you can just see, you can tell, um, there's relationships built and they're meaningful um, when they look up to their y'alls and they look up to their high school mentors. And then being able to see, you know, a grade four student become a high school mentor, then a high school mentor become a y'all. Yeah, it's just that, that whole circle happens and it's just awesome to see. Um, and during um, our COVID times, a lot of our schools have been closed, so program wasn't being able to be delivered. Um, but uh, we tried, uh, I worked with Heather McCray, I don't know if you guys know her, but uh, just recently where uh, we supported five communities to, del to deliver programs, Safe at Home program, where we bought um, packages of four days of activity um, items and literally um, I, I went out and delivered all these boxes to the communities and just to uh, offer some sort of supports and ways of 
trying to deliver IYMP virtually and in a safe, safe way during our times here. Um, so that's what we've been doing and we're still, you know, supporting our communities and our community leads that take on IYMP in their communities and our, our y'alls uh, the best way we can and we'll continue to do that until we start to open up again. Thanks, Tamara. And yeah, we really should acknowledge um, the hard work from uh, Dr. Heather McRae. She's the Indigenous uh, lead um, in the Faculty of Kinesiology and was, was really crucial to launching this entire program in Winnipeg School Division Number 1 alongside Joni Hallis, which is where uh, Jessica um, met our program and, and became a leader. Um, Jack, thank you again for that wonderful opening. And I, I just want to ask you a question about something we hear a lot of from our group is the importance of land and land-based activities. Um, and I think that's a big component of, of health for youth. But can you maybe speak to the importance of land for the health of Indigenous people? Yes, I guess, uh, like I said, to me, uh, over the years, because uh, I, was, I was raised on the land. I was raised in a bush away from the, the main community of Norway House. And of course, back then too, there was only one one store, and I, I would, there were two in Norway, was two Hudson Bay Company stores. So we didn't have access to the foods that we have today. We didn't have all the, the sweets that the kids have nowadays. But to me, at my age now, I go back every chance I have back to the land. Even the last few days now, I've been trying to go out and been raining. I still I would like to be out there. Land based training or whatever you have for everything, I think it's important. I will tell you about my healing journey. I was an alcoholic and a drug addict for a number of years. Even though I never ended up on the street, I still had problems with alcohol and cocaine. I tried treatment centers. I went to four different treatment centers and every time I couldn't stop. I went back there. The longest I ever stayed sober and straight was one year. And then I went back again to drinking and cocaine. The last stages of my, of my drinking, I, I lost everything. My wife left me. I lost, we had our own house in Nepal. I lost that. I was working for legal aid. I was a, a paralegal number of years. My wife was a school teacher. She made good money. I made good money. But a lot of that went up my nose. Finally, she had enough. She couldn't stand my drugging and drinking. She left. I lost the house. I lost my job with legal aid because I got caught with cocaine. That was the end of the line. I ended up in jail because I was caught with cocaine. I was in, I'd never been in jail before. And this was something that I, I contemplated suicide. I had lost everything. There was nothing left. I came to Thompson. I lost my house, I lost my wife, I lost my job, I lost my truck, I lost my boat, I lost my camper, I lost everything. There was nothing left. I came to Thompson and again, I went to a treatment center. 
when I was in that treatment center for 28 days. To this day, I still think that these treatment centers are too short. 28 days is not enough. When I finished my 28 days and I was ready to, to leave, I didn't want to leave. I was afraid. I was scared. I asked, can I do another program for another 28 days? They said, okay, you can stay in there 28 days. So I did the program again. When I was coming to an end, now what? I have nothing. I got no home. I got, I don't have a job. I don't have nothing. What am I going to do? I'm coming to the end of the second term. I'm going out in the bush. I'm going to go back out in the bush. So I left Thompson after I got out the second time from the treatment center, 17 miles from here. And it was in August. So I went and I, lived in a tent. I had a tent, a tea kettle, a frying pan, and a saw. I didn't mean to have an ax. So I went out to the land. And there I started my healing journey. I had to go back. I stayed out there for two years. Going back, learning about my culture. When visit medicine people, when visit elders, or every chance I had, I could spend time with them somewhere. That's how I started my healing journey. And that's how I got well. If I didn't go back, I don't think I'd be here today. And that was 22 years ago. When elder I seen during my stay out in the wilderness, his elder said to me, Jack, I heard you went home. I thought he meant I went back to Norway Elves. No, I said, yeah. I heard you were living in the, out in the land. I said, yeah. Well, uh, you went home. You went home. And now you're healing because you went home. So that's why going back to the land is very, to me, that's the best thing anybody can, an indigenous person can do. I have been in different committees where they had talk about treatment centers and that then I had said the best place to have a treatment center is out in the land somewhere. The treatment centers that we have, like we have here in Thompson AFM, in Thompson, the Paul, Winnipeg, they're only shorter, 28 days. And what do they do when they come out? Like when we had here the first treatment center in Thompson, as long as you walked out the door, a block away was a bar. Another two blocks was another bar. A block and a half was a liquor store. How can anybody have any healing when you're surrounded by what you are addicted to? It's important. My grandson, one of my grandsons, who goes out and joins the ceremonies, he's been to four sun dances. He's 17 years old now. And he, he loves the land. And thank God right now at 17 years of age, he has never gotten into any trouble. He's not, he doesn't smoke, he doesn't drink. That is important. And another thing that I always say when we talk about the diabetes among younger people, I am, I was diagnosed with diabetic type two. As when I was about 60 years old, 60, something around there, 20 years, over 20 years ago, anyway, I was diagnosed with type two diabetes. When I was younger, 
We didn't have Wall Street. Today, I have a partner who lives in La Roche in the Northern store. Yeah, as far as you walk into that Northern store, what do you see? You don't see health foods. You see chocolate bars, potato chips, drinks, lighting shelves. And if they do have health foods, it costs them fortune. How can we expect children in our northern communities to learn about health foods when they see nothing but junk food when they walk into the store? But to me, take the kids out to the land. You guys are doing a wonderful job listening to you, listen to the people that have spoken here of what they are doing in the communities. You're doing a wonderful, wonderful job because we got to teach our children about health foods. Yeah, it's pretty hard now to take uh, kids out into the land and say, okay, we're going to have some rabbits tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so they'll just look at you and say, what? <laughs> but it's good to have a program like you are doing now. So in that, I just want to say you guys are doing a, a wonderful job, and it's a hard job to try and teach our young children to eat healthy. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. Um, and Jack, you did an amazing job teaching a number of people in mile 20 when they went up, uh, Tamara and I and a lot of others. So, um, and so Miles and Jessica, I'm just going to pivot a little bit. Miles, did you go up to mile 20 uh, for one of those uh, uh, cultural workshops? Yes, we did. Yeah, we, me and the previous director of education went up there for the few days. Holy man, that was such a journey. That was such a good experience you know to actually like what jack said to be in the land to feel it you know to do all the activities we were doing all of the birch bark bitings you know to see all the medicines jack was talking about cooking the teepee the sweat lodge the 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 sundance round uh the sundance thing there holy man that was such an experience you know to, and it instilled it instilled a sense of pride in me to know where i come from and to you know, finally get to experience that firsthand, not just to see it, but to be in it, you know, that was such a magical thing, you know, uh, that was a, like four, three years ago, three, four years ago. Yeah. I was, yeah. There with Tamara. I was there with Tamara and we got to do everything there and it was just beautiful waking up in the bright 6 a.m. morning to see the dew on the trees, the birds chirping, the animals scurrying to see all the sun the the fog in the sky you know that it just that is something else to see it's just so beautiful awesome i'm just gonna end with one question i'll go jessica miles tamara um your favorite story of a youth that's really benefited from the program um or your favorite story from the program that you'd want to share with other people jessica, uh, or miles then jessica then tamara okay um um let me see one of my favorite stories would happen to be one of my really good friends now he is um 20 years old now he joined the program when he was a, like just a younger and like a 16 year old teenager and you know he was a mean kid he was a jerk he he would get he would get on your nerves he would do this and that you know he was a mean kid his name is james and um after a few years of being in the program, you know, he grew up, he earned, he learned a sense of respect and responsibility. It's not only just to stop being a jerk, you know, a mean kid and, you know, stuff like that. He actually grew up, he got to, um, he turned into a fine young adult. Now I see him from time to time. He is a part of my game -thon group and he's such a great help. You know, he's, he's, he's changed so much to the point where I can't believe it sometimes, you know, how, Mm -hmm. You could see somebody and they change into somebody, a better version of themselves, you know, and that is so amazing. That just makes my heart warm, either heartburn or love. <laughs> it's, it's That's just, great, so Jessica. Cool. Thanks, Miles. Yeah. My favorite? 
school. Yeah. Uh, I think it would have to be taking what I learned from Spark into IYMP. I think the kids really enjoyed that, like learning off Blair and Norbert. Everything that we did, like land-based learning, and I think the kids really enjoyed those games that we did. So I think that's been fun. That's that's great. And Spark is a program led out of the Faculty of Kinesiology, led by Heather McCray and Joni Hallis, where young adults get a certificate in recreation and and leadership. Um, and some of the key knowledge keepers there, Norbert Mercury from MFNERC and Blair Robiard, uh, who's an affiliate with the faculty. Um, thanks, Jessica. I'm glad uh, that is a great story and that uh, spark is resonating through Garden Hill. And Tamara, uh, your favorite story of, uh, of AYMP, IYMP, or um, someone you feel has really benefited? Um, from the top of my head, I could probably think of doing amazing race in the mountains and Watching you, John, get very competitive during that event. <laughs> so that was that was fun to um, challenge ourselves as the adults <laughs> in uh, our IYP family. Uh, but that was that was a lot of fun, and we ended up winning first. So <laughs> yeah, I lost. I, yeah. That's and, why I was wearing the banana. <laughs> and then I think uh, who benefited the most. Um, uh, I always think of Kennedy uh, in Split Lake, you know, like um, he was such a quiet, shy, very, um, like he didn't have confidence in himself to deliver program. And all I said was, come on, you can do it. I'll show you today what I'm doing and then you take it on. And then he ran program for three years and became, you know, that leadership in in IYP at their school. And from going there for the first week and trying to, you know, just push push him into the program, and then going back twenty weeks later, like that change. And he he created his own program, so I'm very proud of him. Yeah, all our y'alls, awesome. I, I agree, and we had a great core family, y'all. So I'm just going to play one video because uh, we didn't have a few of our other folks on here. And then um, if it's OK, Jack, if you don't mind just closing us out after the video is over, and I'll just say thanks, everyone, for tuning in. And uh, if you have any more info, you can reach out to Tamara or I. Miles, awesome job. Tamara, awesome job. Um, Jessica, awesome job. And so here's a video of our group and from the group out at uh, some y'alls and, and the youth in Sagin First Nation. Mentorship is huge for anyone who gets involved. I definitely think in the long run, it's gonna benefit any community, promoting healthy living through nutritious snacks, playing fun games. We help keep people positive thinking, stay in school and all the other good stuff that comes with being a good role model. Have mentorship in your community. It's awesome. When I do mentorship, I actually learned like, quite a lot about myself. I found an aspect of myself that loves to talk in front of people. Since mentorship, I've been more outgoing than usual. I learned to be humble, patient with myself and with others. I like playing the games and have a lot of good memories here. It's really fun. Some of the kids are really cute too. <laughs> With the mentorship program, you're giving them that good one. Morning. I hope that kids that are on the other provinces join it to have that same experience as you know we did. All I want to do is just be able to bring more and more people to this program, maybe see 
my good C my little brother Jones player. That was Superman Aaron Fontaine, uh, who's another outstanding y'all, and he's living in Brandon now. So uh, over to you, Jack. Okay, thank you. Again, I I enjoyed this uh, meeting just had, and that was everybody the best. So, and as always, in respect for other people's beliefs, respect for other religion, other denomination. I would like you all to join me, those who wish, in closing with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and that it will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine the kingdom, honor and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Echo Sane. Thank you. Echo Sane, uh, Chimigwech. Thank you, everyone. And uh, hopefully we see you at our next webinar. Uh, take care and enjoy the rest of your week.